Welcome to the Marketing Mentor Podcast with Elise Benham, founder of Marketing-Mentor.com and author of seven books, including The Creative Professional's Guide to Money. Since 2008, Elise has been interviewing her clients and other successful professional creatives who are doing what it takes to stop the feast or famine syndrome, get better clients, and command the fees they deserve, and sharing the nuts and bolts of what they've learned so you can do it too. You can find more at marketing-mentor.com. And now, here's Elise Bennett. Pricing is tricky for creative professionals. And although practice makes perfect for most things, I have found that for most creatives, getting the pricing right takes longer than learning most of the other aspects of running a creative business. That means that instead of giving in to hourly pricing or letting your clients dictate price, you have to keep working at it to get it right so that it serves your purposes, which I hope is to build a thriving business. That's what Michael E. Stern has done in his 36 years in business. He has learned a lot about the kind of animal he is, and through that process has developed three strategies to price his time-lapse filmmaking and corporate portraiture. This is Elise Benin of marketing-mentor.com, and in my second podcast interview with Michael Stern, he shared his pricing process, including what he calls the JB factor and many other pearls of wisdom. Listen, and then try it for yourself. Welcome, Michael E. Stern, and uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Elise. Yes, uh, you got the name right, Michael E. Stern. There's too many Michael Stearns around, so I use the E. And at the moment, I specialize in construction, time-lapse filmmaking, specifically on demolition projects, grading projects, or construction projects. I also do a lot of portraiture, mostly at the corporate level. And I'm based out here in Pasadena, California. Excellent. And today we're going to talk about pricing. We are. We are. And the reason I wanted to talk with you about pricing is because you and I did a podcast interview for the Marketing Mentor podcast, and we talked a lot about your niche and your focus. And I really felt like you have, you say all the right things, and you have the perfect, in my opinion, attitude in general about how to run a creative business. So I wanted to bring you, <laughs> Thank on, you. you're welcome. And so I wanted to bring you, uh, it's not a compliment, actually, it's just the facts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to take it as a compliment, okay? Okay, you can. I, I need all the love I can get. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to bring you on this podcast to talk in general about the right attitude for pricing creative services, even though a lot of the people who listen are designers or owners of design firms or designers who want to run their own business and some copywriters and, and photographers. But I want to speak in general about the right attitude for pricing. So where would you start with that, Michael? Well, uh, I'd like to lay out a caveat before we begin, uh, just to let people know, uh, I have been self-employed in a creative business for 36 years, actually uh, the middle of September will be 36 years, which really blows my mind. I went to Art Center and had one class in business. Uh, I've gone to sales training seminars. I talked to people in sales in the early part of my career. I, I worked at a company for a while and watched how the salespeople work and price work and talk to customers. And I immersed myself in this whole process of getting work understanding what the customer or client wants and then pricing it and so i my experience is more practical than sitting in a classroom so i come from that point of view so i want people to understand you know i'm i'm talking as a creative who's made it work i'm an artist first who's been able to run a business as opposed to a business person who got into the art field and i think that distinction is very important uh, <clears throat> so my pricing thoughts Anything I do is a combination of three things. 
the drivers for me are when I'm pricing something, it's instinct, emotion, and numbers. And I, I can, I'll break all three of those down, but you have to have the right, you have to understand what kind of an animal you are. We are nuts to think that in the first place to think that us right brainers can work in a left brain world. I mean, it, on its face, it just doesn't seem like it's going to work because the, the analytical, logical side of left brainers and the numbers and everything in columns and, you know, color between the lines is sort of, you know, goes against the grain of what us creatives like to do, which is, you know, think outside the box and come up with these wild ideas and, you know, tap into our emotions and make art. So there's a fundamental conflict right there. And so I've been able to uh, develop this idea for myself that works, instinct, emotion, and numbers. And, and the instinct part is you have to have a gut feeling that this is the right price. And your, your gut feeling on a project, when, when a call comes in or an email comes in, and I listen to the scope of work, I listen to what the potential client wants, as I'm writing down notes and listening to what they say, my instinct already has a number in mind. And it turns out that that number is almost always correct, within 10%, give or take. And I think that that works for me because of these three rules that I live by in terms of the instinct side of, of my pricing model is I have true self-love. I, I don't put myself on harm's way. I get plenty of rest. I eat well. Uh, I care for myself. I don't do things that are going to hurt me. Uh, I care about what happens to me. Uh, I have been able to access that little voice in my head the little birdie, that little thing that kind of goes off when something is right or wrong, you know, your conscience, if you want to call it that. And I've proven to myself that I can trust listening to that voice in my head. And I've had enough experiences where when the warning bells go off and I've acted in the way that the warning bell guides me, the outcome has been the right outcome. So I trust my instincts that I come up with the right number. Okay, and wait. Before you go on to the second rule then, what if someone doesn't trust themselves? What if someone doesn't mm -hmm. have that, the right instinct and finds himself coming up with the wrong numbers? I was actually speaking this morning to someone who I thought was way underpricing himself because he's new. So what do you do in that situation? Well, in the beginning... Uh, I spent about 30% of my time working on myself. Who am I? How do I fit in the world? Why do I react the way I react to certain things or certain people? Uh, observing people, observing the beta males, I mean the alpha males and the alpha females and how people interact in the corporate structure. I was doing a lot of business with the Walt Disney Company. And so I was always in their corporate offices in various levels. I spent a lot of time on the studio lot. I spent a lot of time in the corporate offices. And I observed and watched. And all of that input, all of that data helped me to figure out what kind of a person I am and how to access that little voice. Like you meet somebody and almost instantly you'll go, I mean, you'll know within 30 seconds, hey, I like that person or I don't. That's your little birdie going off. There are, there are lots of little clues that you, you have to spend the time and focus inward and understand how you respond to certain situations and certain people. And, and that, that reaction is the little voice in your head, and you have to learn to trust it. And you put yourself in situations where, you, where that birdie pops up and you act on for instance uh, here's a here's a perfect example where i ignored it and it cost me big time i was hired by the disney company to do a big shoot with the mickey mouse character and the character the person that's in the costume came up to my studio you know that comes with a chaperone uh you can't depict mickey holding you know uh, like chainsaws or guns or cigarettes or alcohol they're very very strict and and this is a, a, a big shoot for the publishing division, and it was like a $5,000 day shoot. It was big for me. I had an assistant. I don't know. I shot like 40 rolls of film. I take it up to the lab, the photo lab, and I, I say, you know, process them four rolls at a time. Don't do them all at once. And as I left, the little voice went off on my head. They're going to screw this up. Go back and double check. I went, no, 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 no. They do that all the time for me. They know me. It's going to be fine. I'm driving back to my studio. 
go back and check, they're going to screw it up. And lo and behold, by the time I got back to my studio, which isn't even 20 minutes down the road, they called me and said, uh, we screwed up and put all of the film in the, in the processor at once in the wrong chemistry. And they ruined the entire shoot for me. Wow. I ignored the little birdie. I don't know what it was about. I don't know what triggered it. I can't tell you what the trigger was, but the alarm bells went off and I ignored it. And it cost me. I had to reshoot it. You know, may a culpa to the client. The lab, you know, obviously didn't charge me for processing. Uh, you know, and, and everything worked out. I, I got the, I, you know, I reshot it and it cost me some money and whatever. I had to save the relationship with the client. And that was the main thing. But I didn't listen to the little instinct. And, and that was the point for me where I went from now on when that little birdie bell rings, I'm going to pay attention. So that was a seminal moment for me. And uh, I think creatives are tuned into that little voice in your head because how else do we make our artwork? How else do we write, produce, direct, sing, emote, act, make pictures? You know, it's all about internally how we process the world and we spit it out for people to see and comment, enjoy, or be an annoyed by it or whatever the reaction is. So here's a thought then. If you're saying, and I agree with you, that creatives are tuned in to that instinct, but often I think they, we, have a little voice in our head that says also, we're just not real good business people. And so that Absolutely. obstructs hearing, you know, access to that little voice when it comes to things business related. Well, it's true. We're not good at business. We have to learn it, just like the devotion to the craft. That same devotion has to be applied to the business aspects, not in a huge way. Take it a little, st a little bit at a time. How do I make a budget? Or, or even simpler, you know, break down what does it cost me to do a photo shoot? What does it cost me to write this copy? What does it cost me to make this illustration? You know, break it down into little itty baby steps. You know, like that movie, uh, you know, the dad said to the girl in the film, contact, small moves, small moves. Take it a little bit at a time. When I was learning about saving and investing and putting together my retirement package as a self-employed person, I would just read stories in the paper. And what is a bond? What is an equity? What, what does all that mean? I mean, for me, it was a process as well. I, I know what I don't know, and so I have to learn it. And you just have to spend the time figuring that stuff out and understanding. And eventually, you, you oh, my God, I'm a little smarter today than I was yesterday about this. And you've got to give yourself a little pat on the back and understand, I know nothing about this. I have to learn it and, and just start going. If you don't, the world is going to pass you by you know, at light speed. So either if it's too much for you, then you have to find a job somewhere where someone takes care of you. But if you want to work for yourself, you just have to bite the bullet and start learning the stuff and start reading about it. All right. Excellent. Go back to where you were when I distracted <clears throat> you with my question. You mean when you interrupted me? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. So, so the next part is the emotion. Uh, it, it's an experienced driven way to price your work. It can be self-defeating if you don't have the aforementioned instinct developed and refined. So I, I love myself. I take care of myself. I have, I, I, I discovered that I have this knack for kind of knowing what the number should be. Uh, and, but the emotion part of it is there's the JB factor that goes into all of my pricing. And the JB factor <clears throat> means just because. It's very ego-driven. And when somebody calls me to do the work, they think I'm special. And I'm going to repay that love by pricing my work as if I was that special because I am. And that means that my prices are a little bit higher than the competition. And I don't... Uh, I don't um, I don't apologize for it. I, I, I know that I am a low volume, high margin shop. I don't take on a lot of work at low prices where I have to do 10 or 15 jobs a month to make money. I can do one or two jobs a quarter and make enough money. I give every job, every little detail, I sweat bullets over it and I give it a lot, a lot of thought and I work uh, very, very hard on all of my projects. Uh, I also try to have healthy and productive relationships, collaborative relationships with my 
uh, clients. And the emotion part can also uh, scare you because uh, I, I did a job recently. It was uh, the call came in in January and February, uh, uh, January, we, and February I started shooting it. So January we were talking, the client explained what they wanted, and they had budgeted about $10,000 for the project. And I went out to the location and I walked through it and I came up with some ideas and did some, based on your help, did some, did a really nice proposal. And the final budget came in at $28,000. And I did not flinch at all telling him this was what it was going to cost to have me do the work because I know what I'm going to deliver to you and I know I'm going to put in more time than I'm even budgeting for. The final number actually came in at $35,000 because they had some issues that uh, you know, they just had to pay me for. And I don't want to get into the details. But don't be afraid to say the right number. If you love yourself and you know what kind of an animal you are and you know how hard you work on a project and you know what they want to use your work for, then this is the price of fun. This is what it's going to cost them to get you to do the work and you don't apologize for it. You may not get the job and that's a possibility that you have to live with. But if they come back and say, yeah, gosh, it's just too much money. We can't do it. I would rather at that point say, you know what? I'll throw in an extra 10 hours of post-production or I'll come out and do what I call rover days. It's a term in time lapse. I'll do an extra rover day a month for you. I would rather add to the package and give them more than take away from my price and lower it. Once you get into that spiral of lowering your price, they're going to grind you down like a tree stump gets ground down by a utility crew pulling out an old dead tree. You're going to just just hit the earth hard and quick. You don't want to get into that discount pricing, lower the pricing thing. I would rather add to them, add to their value, and that adds to my credibility. And that's a much more positive way to deal with a pricing objection than, oh, oh, oh okay, well, I mean... What if I'd came come in at twenty eight thousand dollars and said, you know what, we can't spend more than ten? I, I'd say, well, what you're asking to do, and you love the proposal, this is what it's going to cost, and I'm sorry, I cannot come down to ten thousand dollars. It's just not going to work. Uh, you know, I, I would have to have that discussion, that answer, and I would have to walk away from it. I'm okay with walking away from a job. It doesn't mean I'm a bad person or I have no value. It means that they're not ready to work with me. I'm ready to work with them. They're not ready to work with me. You've always got to reflect positively on yourself and be the person that pats you on the back because maybe no one else is around to do it. And you've got to have that positive, I'm good at what I do. I love what I do. I just have to find the right clients. This was just wasn't a good fit right now, and I just have to let that go. But you gained experience from that interaction by how they responded to you. And you have to make notes and think about, how did I, God, did I talk too much? I, I didn't listen enough. Uh, did I tell an inappropriate joke? Or maybe, maybe it's not even you. Maybe you just don't like them. Maybe your little birdie said, well, these people are going to be tough to work with. I'm not sure I even want the job. You know, all those things come out in the emotion part. And just one other aspect of that before we move on to that third element, because mm -hmm. in this situation, you heard their budget, $10,000, you ran mm -hmm. the numbers, you crunched the numbers, you came back with something which was essentially three o times. Almost, almost three times, right? yeah. What they mm -hmm. proposed Mm -hmm. And they went for it and more. And so the thought there is don't take someone's budget all that seriously because sometimes there's more money than they say. Well, yes, there's always more money. Here, here's the game. They, as the client, want to get the most out of you for the least amount of money. And you, as the provider, want to get the most money for what they're asking you to do. That is essentially the game. And they're predisposed to always say no. The first thing they want to say is no, we can't afford it. That no just means you're one step closer to yes. You have to have that attitude. And there's always more money. If they really want you, if you have the gravitas, if you have the portfolio, if you have the confidence when you speak to them, if you are articulate, 
if the material on your website uh, comes across as somebody who is well-spoken and understands what they're selling and what they're providing, if you have all those bases covered, you go forth with, with a strong, positive attitude and don't believe them when they say they don't have any money. The honest clients will tell you, you know what? I mean, here's what happened with this client. She, she said, wow, if we go with you on this project, that's going to be most of our marketing budget. And I heard that and I'm thinking, okay, but that's not my problem. That's your problem. <laughs> There's more money. So, so, so some, you got to find, you know, big corporations have pots of money, capital improvement, marketing, advertising, you know, uh, employee uh, morale boosters, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, overhead. They, 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 there's buckets and pockets of money everywhere in a corporation. The fact that marketing doesn't have enough money for your project doesn't mean that there's not enough money for the project. Their particular area might be underfunded at a particular time. Who knows why? But there is more money to be had if they really want you. And their problem is not your problem. You have to stick to your guns. I know what I'm going to do in the throes of this project when it's 2 in the morning and I can't sleep because I had this idea. I'm going to go in and I'm going to work on it. I'm going to solve this problem. You can't bill for that time, but that's time you're going to put in. You know that. You know you're going to be handcuffed emotionally by this project because you care so much about it and you want to deliver a good product. You have to stick to your guns. You know you're good. And... And you've just got to have that self-love that will not put you in harm's way and say, okay, I'll do it for 10000 I don't make any money at 10000 I make money at 28000 I have a, a life to live that needs to be fed every month with these little greenbacks. And I've got to make sure that I bring those greenbacks in. I mean, that's, that's an equation that I have to constantly deal with. And wasn't that the third element, math? Math, yes, yes. So the, so the third element are the numbers. It's the driest part of the process. But you have to know what your numbers are on a monthly basis. I live in Southern California, not exactly the, the cheapest place to live. And I have uh, you know private high school tuition to pay every month, plus all the other stuff. My, my insurances and taxes and money I have to put away for retirement and you know maintenance on the house and monthly groceries and blah, blah, blah. All that stuff, I know what my numbers are. I know what goes out in terms of cash every month. And I know what kind of numbers I have to hit to make a profit. I'm not here to uh, survive. I'm here to thrive. So I do understand the numbers. So my instinct, a number pops into my head. Uh, I can deal with that number emotionally. It's the right number, probably. And then when I run the math, what's it going to cost me to travel to the location 27 times in six months? How many cameras are going to be permanently installed? How much storage space am I going to have to keep uh, have on my system? How many hours am I going am I going to be in post production? How much time uh, spent with the client emailing and phone calling? Uh, how much time spent, you know, preparing invoices and collecting, uh, you know, all the stuff. How does all that? So my 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 cost number shows up, and then I apply that against the budget. I've the the instinct number that I that's popped into my head, and okay, there's enough margin. This is a good price. I can make this thing work. This will carry me through. Uh, it, it's a it's a kind of a you know, a business person would just laugh at that. No, you, you take your cost of goods, and if it costs you $2,500 to produce the job, and then you should probably have a markup of twice, so that should be a $5,000 job. Well, maybe in a commodity business, but not in a creative business, not in, a, not in the kind of thing that we do. There's an intangible quality to intellectual property. And we have to, it's up to us as the creators of the intellectual property to put a price on it. Uh, and, and just to um, <clears throat> mollify some of the naysayers that may be out there, uh, a cousin of mine is very big in the advertising industry. Uh, he's uh, run some big agencies on his own. He's worked for big agencies. He's part of a, a huge consortium. Uh, he's the vice chairman, and he travels around the world helping companies develop brand strategies and web strategies. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I sent him... He watched my clip reel, my time lapse demo reel, and he said that he would expect to pay between twenty five thousand and fifty thousand dollars for a production at the level that I'm producing it at. 
And that's about the price range that my work goes out the door for. Uh, so that tells me that my instinct part, part has really worked well. Uh, I get it. I'm able to apply it and, and, and I've developed it and it really works. I, I've discovered that I have that particular talent. Uh, you can do it the, the old school way of, you know, if it costs me 25, it, it, let's say the project you're doing is going to take three weeks and your monthly bills are $9,000. And that may be the only job you get that month. You could try to, you know, sell that job for nine thousand dollars and just do it strictly by the numbers. But you have to factor in how special is the work I do, and is this really the right number? I mean, th there's lots of different ways you can attack it, but but the main thing is you know what you can do. You love yourself. You're taking care of yourself. And the client wants to work with you, they have to modify a little bit of their behavior for them to work with you. You have to modify a little bit of your behavior behavior to get so you can work with them. You know, you, you want that sort of collaborative relationship to work as well. It, it, it should not be adversarial. It should not be a fight. And you just have to have the right attitude. But the beginning of all that is... Do you like yourself? Or are you going to take care of yourself? I think it all stems from that basic, I'm a good person, I'm a good artist, I like what I do, and I'm going to get some jobs, and I'm not going to get others. And so the way to balance that is to have enough work in the pipeline, enough opportunities to do your work, that at the sheer numbers of it, percentage-wise, some of them are going to come through. I mean, that's a whole other discussion, how to network, but... Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It makes perfect sense, Michael. I want to thank you for sharing all of that. Give people the web address where they can find your work. Uh, buildabetterphotograph.com, just like it sounds. Can I say one more thing? Yes. Uh, I, got a, I got an inquiry for a project. Uh, this is what, Fry, so, so two days ago. I got an inquiry for a project. It's a very large financial services firm. Uh, they're in downtown Los Angeles, and they're going to punch through the roofs, the, the floors of three of their floors or four of their floors and build a four-story atrium inside the building as a new employee environment. And he was talking about, this is, we're a collaborative company, and I want a time lapse to show the employees on a monthly basis, the progress of their new office environment, because it's going to take about 14 months to do the work. And uh, I'm going to meet with him next week. And he want to know what, you know, what it might cost. I said, well, I really need to come down there and really see uh, what's, what's going on. But as I thought about what he said he wanted, and I looked at their location online, he sent me some pictures. I, I came up with the number, my little instinct number popped up, and I'm going to write that on a piece of paper. And it's that number multiplied by 14 months. And when I go down and meet with them, I'm going to say, listen, let's, let's try a little experiment. You, you've met me. You, you know my work. We've talked about the project. I have a number written down on a piece of paper per month that will get me to do the job for you. I said, will you tell me what the job is worth to you? How much are you willing to spend? And if his number is higher than my number, I'll split the difference with him. So he ends up paying less, and I get a little bit more. If his number is lower than mine, we have to go with my number. I'm going to try that as an experiment. I've, I've given him a number. I've lowered my margin on this particular project because I want to try this as a sales tactic, as a closing tactic. He said the word collaborative in a way that I've never heard it said before, just his tone. So it will be interesting to see if as a financial management person if this is too weird for him to handle but i'm willing to take that chance because if we don't try and explore ways that make sense to us to get our business going we're never going to know and this may be so innovative he goes wow that's the greatest thing i ever heard what if his number is higher and he actually saves money i mean that's going to just get our relationship off to the right start you know, like you can't even imagine so I, I, I'm open to all kinds of weird ways to try to get the pricing thing figured out and make it easier for the client. I love that, Michael, because it's a perfect example of one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, which is how important it is to bring the creativity of your work 
to the business side mm -hmm. of your business. So yes. thank you for illustrating that so beautifully. And I can't wait to hear what happens. I hope you'll tell me and uh, we'll post it and we'll blog about it. And maybe we'll even do another podcast about it. Uh, that sounds perfect, Elise. I'd love to do that. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Give the people your web address one more time. Buildabetterphotograph.com. Spelled just like it sounds. Beautiful. Thank you, Michael Eastern. You're welcome, Elise. Run. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much to Michael E. Stern for sharing what he's learned over the years. You can find his site at buildabetterphotograph.com. You can also listen to the first podcast interview I did with him in which I was blown away by the confident sound of his voice when he was talking about how choosing his niche has given him the freedom he wanted for his life and his business. It's really beautiful. This is Elise Benin of marketing-mentor.com. And if you like what you hear and want more, I hope you'll go to the website and sign up for my quick tips and special deals. And I'll be back again soon. Thanks for listening. Now go try out what you've learned. If you like what you hear, you can go to marketing-mentor.com and sign up for Elise's quick tips from Marketing Mentor and her free 30-minute mentoring session to get your burning questions answered. Check out what's on sale in the Marketing Mentor Shop, like the Pick a Niche Kit, Proposal Bundles for Designers and Copywriters, and the 30 Minutes a Day Marketing Plan. Elise is also the host of the How Design Live podcast, a programming partner for How Design Live, the largest design conference, and you can learn all about that at howdesignlive.com. Until next time.